to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm chief. The Apostle Paul penned those words in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 and his life is such a powerful example of transformation for us to study today. We welcome you to our study of great Bible characters. Today we're thinking about Saul of Tarsus, who would later become the Apostle Paul. We want to encourage you, if you haven't got your Bible handy, to locate it and have it ready as we're going to be looking to the Word of God as our authority in our study today. Again, we welcome you to our Bible study today. We're so glad that you've joined us. Today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and members of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night for Bible study, they would love to have you for any of their services at the Lord's Church. At the Church of Christ, you'll find people who love God, who love others, and who are concerned about, is there any word from the Lord? Jeremiah 37, verse 17. If you'd like to sit down and study the Bible, you've got a Bible question, something you've been wondering about, they'd be more than happy to discuss that with you. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. Won't you check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can find all our material, video lessons, audio lessons, transcripts, study questions, great articles and study material, and it's all available free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson on great Bible characters or any of our series of topical or textual lessons on every book of the Bible, we'll make those available to you free of charge. Just go to our website, fill out a media request form or contact us at the phone number and information given as well and we make that available to you free of charge we ever even cover the postage to get that to you and as always we want to in our fast-paced world promote our gospel of christ app for your phone whether it be an android or an apple those are available from the respective stores uh, apple app stores for a free download as well Today we're thinking about one of the great heroes of transformation in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul. His life in and of itself is a great study of going from a life devoted to tradition and uh, the ideals of men to one which made a 180 degree turn of commitment to God. Let's think for just a minute about who is this Saul of Tarsus of his former life? And here's what we know. Tarsus was a city in Cilicia, and it was the hometown of Saul. Acts 9 verse 11 teaches us that. Saul, of his background, he was a Jew or a Hebrew of the tribe of Benjamin, of which he was very proud. Philippians chapter 3 verse 5 tells us that. His trade... Uh, what he did for a living, he was a tent maker. Acts chapter 18, verses 1 through 3 uh, tells us that. He was a Pharisee. Philippians 3, verse 5, and the word Pharisee means one who is separated. He, he basically, as a Pharisee, you would dedicate your life to the teaching and traditions of both the Torah, the law, and of the uh, fathers, the writers of that day, the, the scribes of that day. And so he was greatly committed to the Pharisaical tradition. He was highly educated. Acts 22, verse 3, he was taught by the greatest, one of the greatest scholars and teachers of that day, Gamaliel. 
And Saul himself was an exceptional student of the law and of the traditions. In fact, in Galatians 1, verse 13 through 14, he would say of himself, I excel beyond many of my contemporaries in that law and in that tradition. But as you think about Saul of Tarsus, and as we really learn more of who he was, here's what we know as it relates to Christianity. We are first introduced to Saul in Acts chapter 7, verse number 58 as he is consenting to the death of God's martyr, Stephen. Stephen has boldly proclaimed Jesus as the fulfillment of the law, as the Messiah, and that contradicted the traditions of the Pharisees. And up to this point, Saul's consenting to that. He's holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen to death. That's the first account we have of his zeal and his hatred at this point for Christianity and Christ and its followers. We learn next in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, that Saul is wreaking havoc and zealously persecuting the church. Listen to Acts. I want you to hear what Saul was doing in Acts chapter 8. Listen to Acts chapter 8, verse 1 following. Concerning Stephen's death, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. Now watch about Saul. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women and committing them to prison. Saul of Tarsus was like a wrecking ball. He was doing everything in his power to tear down, to destroy, and listen to this language, to wreak havoc. When you think of havoc, that's a term of chaos. That's a term of upheaval. He's doing everything he can to turn Christ and its church upside down and so his church upside down and so he's doing great harm to the Lord's church and yet as we follow this progression further in Acts chapter 9 he's on his mission intent on doing more harm to the church the Bible says in Acts 9 verse 1 following he has official documents from the leaders of his day that if he finds any who are of the way, he can bind them, bring them to Jerusalem bound, and likely some of those people will even be put to death. And so he's on the road to Damascus. He's out as a bounty hunter, as it were, looking for Christians who he can find worshiping and following Christ. He's going to arrest them and have them prosecuted for that. And so he's on the road to Damascus. And yet something amazing happens. As he's walking down that road, headed to do harm to the church, a light shines around him. He hears a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And Saul responds by saying, Lord, what a change in Saul's mentality like that. Lord, what would you have me to do? He's blinded. They take him by hand into the city. He's told that God's going to send him a servant to him to tell him what he'll do. Uh, Acts 9 verse 18, he's waiting and Ananias comes. Acts 22 verse 16, Saul recounts that and Ananias comes to him and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Think about what just happened in this man's life. From consenting to Stephen's death, to wreaking havoc on the church, to dragging men and women in prison, to being a bounty hunter against Christ and Christians, he now does a 180 where he is actually on his knees calling Jesus his Lord and obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ.
Friend, I want us for just a moment to think about the practical applications we can learn from the transformation in Saul of Tarsus' life to the Apostle Paul that I can make practical in my life today. What do we know about Saul of Tarsus? Friend, please hear me well on this. This is such a practical lesson. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad that's been. It doesn't matter how deep in sin and tradition you've been steeped in. Anyone can turn to Jesus Christ and become a child of God. Sometimes in talking to people, I hear people say things like, you know, I'm just too bad. Things I've done are just too bad. I've lived too sinful of a life. We hear people say, if that person walked in the church building, the roof would fall down on them. Friend, please understand today, you haven't probably done these things. You haven't consented to Christian's death probably. You haven't wreaked havoc on the church. You haven't probably haven't drugged men and women to prison for following Christ. And even if you had done those things or, or things worse than that, you can be forgiven and you can be become a child of God. Sometimes people think that their sin is just too much. But friend, that's the very reason Christ came. Jesus came to deal with the sin problem. And He is able to save completely those who come to God through Him. Hebrews 7, verse 28 and 29. And Saul, so Saul is a perfect example of how one can turn from sin no matter how bad that sin may be. You know, here's some other practical lessons we learn from Saul of Tarsus. I learned from Saul of Tarsus that He's a great example of one who faithfully followed his commission. Look in Acts chapter 26. When, when, when Paul, when Saul of Tarsus converted to the gospel, he really converted. He gave himself fully to that cause. Listen to Acts 26, verses 16 through 18. Saul is told, But rise and stand, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister. This is God talking to him and a witness both of the things which you've seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith. And Paul said, Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to this heavenly vision. Saul committed himself. He faithfully, fully committed himself to God and to the cause of Christ. Friend, there's nothing worse than doing anything halfway. There's nothing worse than doing three-quarters of the way because you're still leaving out some of it. Paul fully committed to God. That's what I learned from his life. Give yourself fully to the cause of Christ. Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Every day, from the example of Saul of Tarsus and his conversion and transformation, remember, I need to fully commit, commit myself to Almighty God. What else do I learn from Saul of Tarsus? The Apostle Paul was not ashamed of the gospel message. Romans 1.16, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to all who believed. Paul wasn't ashamed of it because he knew that message was the only way people could be saved. What about us today? Haven't we made a transformation Friend, if you're a child of God, you've been called out of darkness into His marvelous light. 1 Peter 2, 9. Every sin has been washed away. Revelation 1, verse 5. You're a child of the King. Don't be ashamed of that which saved you. You know, sometimes we think to ourselves, I need to talk to this person about the gospel. 
I need to tell my neighbor. I need to tell my friend. I need to reach the lost with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And and then sometimes we feel a little embarrassed. Maybe they won't like me as much. Maybe they'll reject the message. Maybe they won't want to be my friend. Friend, regardless of how others respond, don't be ashamed of the Savior who died for you and the message that saves our soul from eternal damnation. What else do I learn from Saul of Tarsus? Saul is a great example of one who aggressively and actively contended for the truth. He stood up for what was right, and he contended uh, for the truth. Listen to Acts chapter 13. You know, Saul wasn't, not, he was not only ashamed, but he wasn't afraid to stand up and contend earnestly for the gospel as Jude 3 teaches. Listen to Acts chapter 13. I want you to notice the example of verses 6 through 12. The Bible says, Now when they'd gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus, who was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elamus the sorcerer, for his name was translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O oh, full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, and not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him. He went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Do you think it was difficult? You think it was difficult for Saul to say to this man, you're a fraud, you're a deceit, you're a son of the devil, you're a worker of unrighteousness? This man had probably some position and clout, and, and Paul could have put, been harm done to him because of that. And yet Saul stood up. He aggressively contended for the truth and did what was right and followed, ultimately followed, the will of God. What else do we learn from the example of Saul of Tarsus? Saul was a hard worker for the truth. I want you to look in your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 10. Notice as we think about Saul, what a hard worker he was. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I want you to notice what the Scripture says in verse number 10 about Saul or Paul. The Bible says this, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and His grace toward me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. When you think of Saul or Paul, he was a hard laborer. He said, I labored more than all. And I don't want you to just stop and think about this. When you look at the three evangelistic journeys that Paul went on, did you know if you go from place to place, you get your map out, you go from place to place and you map the mileage where Paul went as the crow flies, not taking any detours and not encountering all the way the roads may have turned in that day and age. As the crow flies, Paul traveled 13,000 miles in those three evangelistic journeys. That's on top of all the beatings. That's on top of all the ridicule, the stoning, on top of being abandoned in the sea and all that he went through there, all the Jews who did him harm, Saul was a hard worker and laborer in the kingdom of God. And friend, as I think about my life, as I think about practical lessons from the life of this great man, we're reminded that that's what God wants for all of us, right? To be hard workers in the kingdom, 
John 9 verse 4, Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, for night comes when no man works. Saul worked diligently in the kingdom of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58 reminds us of this. Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding, in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Friend, God's not called me, and God's not called you to fill a pew, to sit in a seat, that, to, to, to be in a church building. Friend, don't misunderstand. Should we go to worship? Should we gather with the saints? Sure. But that's not, that's not the work we've been called to do. God's called us to go out into the world, to live a good example, to do everything we can to bring others to Jesus Christ. And we want to be good workers in the kingdom, just like Saul of Tarsus. As doors open and as opportunities rise, I want to use my talents, walk through those doors, seize those opportunities, and do what I can for the Lord. When I think of another practical lesson, from Saul of Tarsus, I think about him as a great man of prayer. You know, in nearly every letter Paul will write, uh, Ephesians 1, verses 15 and 16, uh, to the church in Philippi, chapter 3, verses 14, following, uh, to the Colossians, uh, to whether it be the Corinthians. Every time we see Paul writing to these people, Paul will often begin by saying, I've been praying for you, and here's what I've been praying for you about. Paul was a man of prayer, and he prayed for other people. As I think about my life, and as you think about yours, we today also, we need to be people of prayer, and we need to give ourselves to God and His cause. Jesus sets the standard for prayer. When I think about His life, Mark 1, verse 35, He prayed early in the morning. Um, Mark chapter 6, he went up on the mountain to pray. Matthew chapter 26, he was in the garden praying. You, you look at Jesus' life and, and all that he did and all that he accomplished. He knew the power of prayer. And don't we understand today, shouldn't we understand today, how we need God and His help through prayer? You see, I can come boldly to the throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16, the Bible teaches us the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous person overcomes much. James 5.16, we are told men ought always to pray and never lose heart. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 17 and 18. And so like Paul, let's be a people of prayer and let's pray for others as well that God will help us to encourage and use them for God's will. And friend, there's this idea. When I think about practical lessons I can learn from Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul, I think about how he deeply loved the church and he deeply loved other Christians. Would you look in your Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? You know, when we look and when we peer into the heart of Paul, you can see how much he loved the church and how much he loved other Christians. Look at 2 Corinthians 12, verse number 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want you to look in verse number 15. The Bible says this, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for your souls, though a more, the more abundantly I love you, the less I am loved. Now look at his love for the church. Back up to 2 Corinthians 11. And Paul mentions all these perils he was in. But look at one that worried him the most. Verse number 28. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, listen to this, my deep concern, for all the churches. When I think about what I can learn from Paul's life, I think about how much he loved other Christians and how much he loved the Lord's church. The Bible says this, let brotherly love continue. Hebrews 13, 1, love one another 
John, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, and 1 John chapters 3 and 4 clearly teach us that idea. I want to do what I can to, to show my love, to encourage, to uplift, to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, Romans 12, 15, and I surely want to love the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. But when I think of Saul's life, we wouldn't do justice if we didn't say, Paul, he was willing to suffer persecution for the benefit of others and the church. Uh, think about in the book of Acts for just a moment. Acts chapter 14, Paul had rocks bounced off his head. In Acts 14 verse 11 following, he said, We must through many trials enter the kingdom of God. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 13, We must through all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. He was beaten with rods. He was shipwrecked. He was imprisoned. He was uh, taken before Caesar. He suffered great harm and persecution at the hand of the Jews. Ephesians 3 13, Philippians 1 verse 12. Paul would recount this idea. Paul wasn't afraid to suffer for what he believed. And friend, as Christians, as we said, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Don't be ashamed of your Lord. You might have to suffer as a child of God. But I guess the final and one of the last lessons that we think about from Paul's life is that when Paul was wrong, he wasn't afraid to swallow his pride and admit it. Listen again to 1 Timothy 1.15. Paul said, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I was chief. When Paul echoed those words, Lord, what would you have me to do? Paul recognized, admitted, swallowed his pride and realized he was wrong. Friend, what about my life and yours? Are we willing to admit when we're wrong and we need to obey God? Friend, can we ask you today, are you a child of God? Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have you submitted to God's will? Have you done what Saul of Tarsus did? Have you arisen, been baptized for remission of your sins, and had them washed away, believing in Jesus as the Son of God? John 8, verse 24, Acts 22, 16. And as a Christian, are we faithfully following God to the best of our ability every day? We hope and pray you'll join us next time as we're going to study another great Bible character. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the